Hi, I'm Peter Tsukahira, and in this session, we're going to begin with part one of a three-part series on how did the gospel of the kingdom transform the nations. Towards the end of Jesus' ministry here on earth, he made two powerful predictions about what must take place before his return. Jesus stood on the Mount of Olives, and he wept over his city, Jerusalem, and his people, the people of Israel. And he said these words that were recorded towards the end of Matthew's gospel. Let's take a look in Matthew chapter 23, beginning in verse 37. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were unwilling. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. For I say to you, from now on, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, Jesus was prophesying over his city, Jerusalem, and the people of his nation, Israel. And he was saying, I'm not coming back to you until you say these words. And in Hebrew, it sounds like this, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, in our modern Hebrew language, if someone comes to your door and knocks and you want them to come into your house, you simply say to that person, Baruch haba. All right, literally it means blessed is he who comes, but in our language it's understood. It simply means welcome. I believe this captures closely what Jesus is saying to the city of Jerusalem. He's saying, I'm not coming back to you until you welcome me back as your Messiah and your King. Then in the next chapter, Jesus speaks about the nations and the things that must take place before he returns. In Matthew chapter 24, the disciples came to Jesus privately. Now, if you know anything about the teaching method of Jesus, even though he had a intense and far-reaching public ministry. He spoke to thousands, even tens of thousands at a time. You'll notice him in the New Testament continually turning away from the masses and turning back to the chosen 12. He invested personally in the 12 disciples, knowing that they would be the ones who would carry on his ministry after him. He said these words to them about the nations. Let's look in Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse 3. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will mislead many. Verse 6, You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, for those things must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Now, I believe that we are in these times at the present time. This area of the Middle East is continually hearing the news of wars and rumors of wars. And just in our time right now, we've, we've seen massive earthquakes in Asia and in various parts of the world. I believe that we're in this time leading up to the return of the Lord. Jesus said that we are not to be frightened by these wars and rumors of wars, but that they must take place. He said that they're really just the beginning of birth pangs. Now, women who have given birth know that birth pangs start out with painful contractions that are very mild with long periods of time in between. But as we get closer to the birth of the child, those painful contractions increase in intensity and frequency so that just before the child is born, you might have one major contraction just seconds after another. Jesus said the end times will be like this. There will be a crisis in our world and then a period of calm and then another crisis. But as we get closer to his return, those crises will increase in frequency and intensity. 
But then Jesus summed up this part of his teaching to his disciples with these powerful words in verse 14. He said to them, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. It's important for us to understand what did he mean by the gospel of the kingdom. Well, first of all, the gospel of the kingdom is more than a gospel of salvation. Many churches preach a gospel of salvation. We go out, tell people the good news of the Bible and about Jesus. Some believe, they pray and invite Jesus to be the king of their lives. They're baptized and come to church and we count their heads on Sunday. More heads on Sunday, that tells us that we're advancing with the gospel of salvation. But the gospel of the kingdom is more than that. It begins with salvation, but it progresses from there to maturity of believers who find their destiny and their calling and their gifting, and then go out into their society as salt and light to live their lives, to produce their fruit, to use their gifts. And the result is that societies change and cultures are transformed. This is the gospel of the kingdom that was preached by Jesus and was, was exemplified by Israel as God's chosen model of his kingdom. God is king of all area of society. And this is what the gospel of the kingdom is all about. Jesus said, this culture transforming, society changing message would be preached in all the world to every nation as a witness before his return. Now the biblical word for witness is closely related to the word for martyr. And it means more than just being killed for your faith. It means that there will be people like you and me who are giving of their lives every day, giving of their time and their talents and their resources to advance the kingdom in every nation of the world. And then Jesus said he would return. So I wanted to know, where was this culture transforming message of God's kingdom ever preached? What did it do? Where did it go? And most importantly, how much of the work is left? So let's take a look into the Bible and we'll follow this journey of this gospel of the kingdom as it burst out of Israel and went out to the nations. Where did the gospel of the kingdom begin? Well, of course, in Israel because Israel was the nation created and chosen by God as the example of his kingdom. But during the ministry of Jesus and afterwards in the hands of people like the Apostle Paul, this powerful message of God's kingdom burst out of Israel and went to the nations. Well, where did it go and in what direction? Let's take a look. Please go with me to Acts chapter 16 and let's begin in verse 6. This is the account of one of Paul's early journeys where he's following the Holy Spirit and bringing this gospel of the kingdom out beyond the borders of Israel. Verse 6, they passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And after they came to Mysia, they were going into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. And passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So Paul is coming from the south, and he, he goes into what is today southern Turkey. Verse 6 says clearly he was forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Now, technically, Asia, we're not exactly sure where Asia was in the ancient world. But one thing is clear, Paul did not turn east. And after verse 6, he tried to go to a place called Bithynia, which is in the north on the Black Sea. But verse 7 says clearly, the Spirit of Jesus did not permit him. And that's why Paul went all the way west across what is today the nation of Turkey until he came to a little town called Troas, and there he stopped. He stopped because Troas is on the beach. It's the site of ancient Troy. It's as far west as you can go before you're looking at the ocean. There, I believe, the Apostle Paul fasted and prayed. 
and cried out to God. And what's written in the Bible is that he had a vision in the night and he saw a Macedonian man in his vision saying, come over and bring the gospel to us. And they knew it was the voice of God speaking to them. And so they took this gospel of the kingdom into Macedonia. These are very strategic verses in the New Testament. And the reason is this. Geographically, Israel is in the Asian continent. Yes, that's right. Israel is West Asia. That means the Bible is an Asian book. It means Jesus is an Asian Messiah and Paul an Asian apostle. But the man that Paul saw in his vision was not Asian. The Macedonian man was a European man. And the European man was saying, bring this gospel of the kingdom to us. And Paul knew it was the voice of God. And he knew from that moment on that God's direction for the expansion of this culture changing, society transforming, gospel of the kingdom would be West. And this message has been changing societies and molding cultures in the direction of the West ever since, even until today. Paul took the gospel into Macedonia and it began to saturate the Greek speaking world. Our first New Testaments were written in the Greek language. And in the New Testament, there are letters to Greek speaking cities, to Thessalonica, Corinth, and Philippi. In the book of Acts, Paul preached in Athens on Mars Hill. He personally and others like him in that same generation took this gospel everywhere the Greek language was spoken and it changed that world forever. The Greek Orthodox Church is one of the oldest Christian traditions that dates back even until those days. The Greek speaking world came out of worshiping its ancient mythological gods and was transformed by the gospel of the kingdom. And after that, the gospel of the kingdom continued to move west. Let's summarize. Towards the end of his ministry, Jesus made two predictions about his return. He said the people of Jerusalem and the people of Israel must welcome him back as Messiah and King before he would come back to this land. And then towards the nations, Jesus prophesied that this culture transforming, society changing message of God's kingdom, God's reign in all areas of society, this message would be preached as a witness in every nation throughout the world before his return. In the days of the Apostle Paul, we see, particularly in the book of Acts, this gospel of the kingdom bursting out of Israel and going to the nations. Paul was directed west, and the gospel of the kingdom has been moving west ever since and transforming nations and changing cultures everywhere it went. In the sessions that follow, we'll be following the expansion of this gospel of the kingdom as it moved powerfully into Europe and then beyond Europe going still west to the new world of America and then beyond America still going west to the continent of Asia in our day.